and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Every year there's just weather differences and moisture differences that drive planting dates to move around with corn and soybeans and also spraying dates. And if you find yourself in that situation and have a corn or a soybean field yet to spray, we'll talk about your late spray options. We'll also discuss the worst insect you can get in soybeans. It's soybean aphid. We'll talk about the threshold you may consider spraying at on your farm and which products you should use. Uh, if those soybean aphids would just attack our weed of the week, it would make control so much easier. But we'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. And first, here's our Farm Basics. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the Enzone Fan Control System from Farm Shop MFG. The Enzone monitors outside conditions to run your fans so your grain naturally reaches ideal temperature and humidity. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about dicamba and some label changes that ended up occurring in June. Dicamba, just to give you a little history, dicamba has been out for our, about 50 years, roughly 50 years, and it has been sprayed all over the world. Dicamba is very lethal to many broadleaf weeds. It is relatively safe to corn and some different crops early in the season, but the real challenge with dicamba came about three years ago when it got labeled on soybeans that were tolerant to dicamba. Now there were some new formulations that came out, namely Extendamax, Ingenia, and Fexapan, but the problem is they were still giving some volatility issues. So just to explain what the difference is between drift and volatility. Drift, that's when you're spraying and you can visibly see the spray move over off target to somebody else's crop. With volatility, what that is, is when it gets sprayed on your crop and then it vaporizes, picks up, and potentially moves off target. Well, when you think about that, this is something, again, as Brian mentioned, it's a active ingredient that's been out there for 50 years or so and you might think well wait a second if there is a little volatility potential why would they put that into a trait stack and now have more acres that dicamba is going out on well it's because the product has been so effective on weed control and it controls a lot of these tough weeds that have become resistant to roundup and quite frankly we hadn't seen a lot of volatility issues prior to three years ago but what ended up happening is people were so focused on I have to spray when there's no wind so a lot of spraying unfortunately got done in the evening or very early morning the problem with that is when you spray too late into the evening or in the early morning is there are issues in terms of the overall environment namely air inversions right as the evening is hitting and into the early morning it's very common to see the soil cool off and there's a hot layer between the soil and the atmosphere. That hot layer traps some of the vapors and so it is common to see a little bit of that vapor getting into that hot layer that might be 10 or 15 feet off the ground and it moves off target. And there was a pretty quick response as soon as the air inversion situation became really important and critical. Well, there's a lot of extra training now that farmers are required to have in order to spray these dicamba products on their farm. So farmers learn about these things and what we've seen is less problems over time. So what happened is four years ago, these products were supposed to get labeled when there were only a few acres of that particular trait of soybean. Well, it didn't get labeled that year. So then the following year, the, the acreage ramped up in terms of the traits for soybeans and for cotton. So then there were literally tens of millions of acres of that trait. So the first year, tens of millions of acres got sprayed with the dicamba. You just can't have that for new products and new situations. So if everything would have gone through as the EPA had told these companies that, hey, it should get approved by this particular year, then it would have been on a few acres. We would have learned everything we needed to know and you wouldn't have seen a big issue three years ago. So that's really, in my opinion, the root cause of the whole problem. If it would have gotten tried on a few acres, we would have figured it out. Now it's figured out. Now we hardly have any problems spraying dicamba. Everybody knows about air inversions. All the farmers and applicators are properly trained, but you can't go back in time. You can't change things. And in the meantime, the Ninth Circuit Court out in California said the EPA needs to vacate these labels. So we'll see what happens in the future. 
This is not affecting any other dicamba products, just these three products that are getting sprayed over the top of Extend Crops. Well, and it just goes to show, even with a 50-year-old product, you still have to keep learning every year and getting better at what you're doing. And one of those things that farmers are trying to learn about every year is our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this weed coming up later in the show. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. Pentair Hypro 3D nozzles are your premier choice for fungicide applications. Syngenta fungicide application field trials have shown Hypro 3D nozzles provide a yield advantage of up to 10% over other nozzles, maximizing the return on your fungicide investment. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. Where we have run the Soil Warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. Now, I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. Their ride is so much smoother. Their seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the Soil Warrior. Challenging field conditions often make harvest difficult. Can your corn head handle it? The GTS X10 corn head from Agra US is a rugged, cost-effective alternative to heavier, more traditional heads. Constructed of durable yet lightweight aluminum, the X10 puts less strain on your combine without losing harvest effectiveness. And it is 40% lighter than traditional heads, reducing field compaction in those less than ideal conditions. For more information, give us a call at 8334-AGRA US. Every year we get into July and Darren and I get phone calls. Um, I didn't get all my weeds killed in corn or I've still got weeds left out there in soybeans. What can I do now? Yes, it's very late, but you still have a few options. We're gonna talk about that today. All right, let's start with corn. This late in corn, the corn's basically at tassel or really close to it. So what we would encourage you to do is just wait until you have brown silk and then you could go out there with drop nozzles. You can't just spray over the top, but you can use drop nozzles and you can spray 2,4-D. Now, I will be honest with you, would I do that? Probably not. It'd probably have to be an absolute disaster out there for me to do that, and here's the reason why. When you have very late season weeds in corn, think about those as a cover crop, okay? They're not gonna hurt this late in the season. They're not gonna hurt your yield. What they can do though, and the reason why a lot of people like to spray is because you're gonna really build up that weed seed bank if those weeds happen to go to seed. And I will just tell you in my experience, if you let weeds go to seed, then a lot of times you're fighting that hard for five years. You will spend extra money for five years in a row. So in some cases, it can be worth it to spray late. But this is why we always talk so much about, hey, do a great job with pre-emerge herbicides, use really good post products, leave yourself some residual, so you're not worried about this. But again, really about the only good option is to go out there with drop nozzles so you, you can get down and get some coverage on the weeds using 2,4-D after brown silk. And really, Brian, this has become less of an issue the last few years, in my opinion, because there have been more residual herbicides being used, even residual herbicides being used in crop post-emerge, versus if you go back even five or 10 years ago, there's still quite a few guys that were using, well, one or two shots of Roundup with zero residual out in the corn, and we're seeing a lot more weed escapes. The other thing that we get into with late weed escapes is, will it affect harvestability in corn? that's generally not a problem. Okay, let's turn to soybeans now. The good news here with soybeans is you have some additional options that you didn't a few years ago. So for example, 2,4-D, Liberty, 
dicamba, Roundup. Okay, besides conventional herbicides, you got to look at what can I do with these other herbicides. So let's talk about that real quick. With the other herbicides, first of all, Liberty and Roundup, you can go ahead and spray through up until full flower. So you might be right there, you might not quite be there, but all I know is if you still have time, you don't have much time. So you better get your Roundup and Liberty sprayed. If you spray Roundup and Liberty, Roundup or Liberty, obviously you have to have the right trait. But keep in mind, they're two totally different herbicides. Roundup, you want low water volume. Liberty, you want high water volume. Roundup, you want bigger droplets. Liberty, you want smaller droplets. Roundup, you probably want some ammonium sulfate in there. That's going to help you in most cases. Liberty, it absolutely has to be in there. So anyway, they are definitely different products. In terms of the 2,4-D and the dicamba, now dicamba in most states you are limited by a date, whether it's June 20th or June 30th, whatever, and you are certainly limited to by 45 days after planting. So you have to be real careful with that dicamba label. Chances are you're done spraying that already. But 2,4-D, you can spray that through R2. So until you start seeing pods in the field at R3, you're good to go on the 2,4-D. And the 2,4-D we're talking about here is in list one. Now in list one would be a little bit like Roundup or Dicamba. We want to have bigger droplets. You don't need a tremendous amount of water, but you're going to have the best results spraying smaller weeds. So the calls we get in July are typically, hey, I got great big weeds. And I just say, look, you're off label. If you want to try some 2,4-D at that point, you certainly can. It'll curl the weeds up, might not kill them. It'll probably help, but it's not going to totally solve your problem unless those weeds are actually on label, usually two to four inches tall. Well, that's the problem. Everyone's looking for a rescue product, and there really aren't any rescue products. Every one of these herbicides wants to see weeds in a two to four inch tall window. Well, when you've got foot tall or two foot tall weeds, that can be a big challenge. Nothing is going to be 100% at weed control at that stage. Now, we've got other weeds that could be popping up in soybean fields like volunteer corn, for example. There's more volunteer corn in 2020 in some of these fields than I've seen in a while. And many farmers have already made that early application, but there was more of that seed out in the field that's popped through. Now that volunteer corn is really big. And I know there's quite a few farmers that are saying, you know, I'm just gonna let it go. It's not worth trying, but you could still use some of the volunteer corn killers. They are limited by pre-harvest intervals, but if you've got plenty of time like you do right now in mid-July, you could still spray one of those if the problem was bad enough. All right, Darren mentioned volunteer corn herbicides but he didn't tell you how to use them to get the best results. What you need to do is number one, you gotta increase the rate, and number two, you've got to use crop oil at this late stage. If you don't do those two things, higher rate, use crop oil, don't expect good control. Okay, talking about the broadleaf herbicides, when you have broadleaves out in fields this late, there aren't many options. It's too late for Flexstar, it's too late for a lot of herbicides. Cobra is probably your best bet. Now. As I say that, understand with Cobra, you're going to drop some leaves off that plant most likely. To safen the Cobra a little bit, we always used to suggest using some solubor, like a pound and a quarter of solubor. In other words, what they found is with adequate boron levels in the plant, the plant is able to recover more quickly from that Cobra. So you're not necessarily going to get any better weed control out of the Cobra with the boron in there, but you're definitely going to safen that herbicide to those soybeans. The other two herbicides that we do occasionally see used this late in the season, and, and both are actually labeled for corn and for soybeans, are Cadet and Resource. They're both excellent products for velvet leaf control, and actually velvet leaf has been on the rise the last few years. So if you do have a velvet leaf problem, believe it or not, Resource and Cadet are labeled up to 48 inch tall velvet leaf. Now, clearly we don't want to see velvet leaf get that tall, but if you do have an outbreak late in the season, these are products that could help you. So once again, very late weed spraying in corn and soybeans is tough. If those weeds are huge, you're probably not going to get control, but if at least you can stop the weeds from going to seed, that hopefully is going to help you for the next few years. Well, one other weed you may be concerned about is our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your fields, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. 
With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soil and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more about Decomp at eggbio.solutions. Find love and then give it all away. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. Hot spots and moisture in your bin can cost you thousands in lost revenue. The end zone monitors outside conditions to run your fans exactly when you want them to, naturally bringing your grain to ideal temperature and humidity. Master bin management with the end zone. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. When you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line, then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. Soybean aphid is a huge issue, and as Brian mentioned earlier, the worst problem that we can see in our soybean fields in terms of insects because it's a piercing sucking bug that just takes the life out of our soybean plants, and oftentimes we can see huge yield losses because we have this pest. Soybean aphids have only been a problem in the United States for about 15 years. So when Darren and I were growing up on the farm, never had this problem at all. And when the problem did show up in the United States, there were a lot of people who said, oh, lady beetles will take care of soybean aphids. And to some degree, they can. So if you're seeing lots of lady beetles around your area, chances are you've had lots of soybean aphids in the last two or three years. With soybean aphids, the threshold is actually much lower than you will commonly hear. And here's the reason why I wanted to bring this up today. This is the most important thing with soybean aphid. The threshold should always, for every insect, be an economic threshold. There is not just a treatment threshold, there's not just a spraying threshold, there's not just a threshold in general, it should always be economic. And by economic, what I mean is, can you treat and make money by treating? Okay, so that's going to change depending on the price of the soybeans. It's gonna change depending on the price of the application and the insecticide. So when you start looking at the true economics of this thing, then every year the threshold will be a little bit different. That's where I get so upset about soybean aphids because many people out there will say, well, 250 aphids, that's the threshold. No, it's not. I can promise you that is not the threshold. I can absolutely guarantee you, bet my life on it, that is not the threshold. It's going to vary. If your crop is worth absolutely nothing and the treatment costs $200 an acre, is the treatment threshold still 250? No, the treatment threshold's probably 100,000. But on the other hand, if the insecticide costs $2 like it does today, the soybean price is, let's call it $8 or, or more, and you, you take a look at the thing, you go, hey, wait a second here. I'm getting 70 bushel beans, or I'm hoping for that, times $8, and it only costs me $2 to spray. I'm out there anyway doing something else, spraying some fungicide or foliar fertilizer, whatever. Um, for $2, you bet I'm spraying. My economic threshold might be 10 aphids per plant, or 20, or 30, or 50. All I know is it's not 250. So don't just fall into the trap of, well, unless it's 250, I can't spray. Absolutely wrong. Well, here's the problem with soybean aphids. They don't evenly disperse across your field. So you can't just go to any plant and say, well, how many are on this plant? Oh, it's 50. Well, the next plant's got 50 as well. No, it's not like that. There's gonna be some plants that have 2,000 aphids on them and then others that have zero. And it's hard to know, well, how does that average out across my field? Because I'm certainly not gonna walk a whole 160 acre field and look at every single plant. So you've gotta be on the lookout for those hot spots in your field. 
if you're using satellite imagery, if you're using drones, this may be a way that you can find some of those spots a little bit more effectively. If you're out with that drone and you say, wow, there's a spot that looks different and that brings you out to that part of the field and you find that you have an aphid hot pocket, I would say get after it right away. Spray those areas of the field. You may not even have to spray the whole field. But here's the easy way. If you're walking fields and you say, I, I just need a heads up about where they might be the worst, well, it's probably about right where I'm standing in this particular field. Now, this is a cornfield, but it's right by a tree belt. Oftentimes, we see these aphids being prolific right around those tree belts. They overwinter on buckthorn plants, and buckthorn plants are found in tree belts. So if you've got a tree belt near your field, that's where I would be scouting first, looking for soybean aphids. The other thing with soybean aphids is the numbers can literally explode in no time. 77 degrees is the ideal temperature for reproduction and the numbers will double in less than a day at 77 degrees. So literally you could go from, hey, I walked out in the field, I just saw a few aphids there and five days later you're going, oh my goodness, I am too late. So make sure you are on top of this thing. The way a lot of people look at it, like we do, is we go, you know, we only this year have a thousand acres of soybeans. It's gonna cost me $2,000 in insecticide, that's it. So let's say that I spray five years in a row, that's $10,000. I just have to recover more than $10,000 over the course of five years in terms of yield. We pull the trigger really early. There was some research done by South Dakota State University about 10 years ago that showed at R2, you only needed maybe 10 aphids per plant or 20 aphids per plant. It was just a ridiculously low number at the economics we have today. So I just really encourage you be scouting your fields on a very regular basis, pull the trigger early, spray a good pyrethroid that's gonna cost you somewhere around $2 an acre. If you wanna bump it up to Lorsban or Bifenthrin, you're gonna spend an extra couple bucks, no big deal, but get the spraying done, be on top of it. Once you hit 250, you're way too late. You've already lost yield, I can promise you that. The other products to be aware of are Transform and Safina. They're very specific to which insects they control, aphids being one of the very few on their labels. Many farmers like to use those if they're concerned about leaving the beneficials alone out in the field. They are very, very effective aphid control products, but they do cost a little bit more. One other thing that is gonna cost you a little money in your field is controlling our weed of the week. We'll show you how to stop it coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? Weed of the Week is Puncture Vine. We talk about things that have burrs on them like cockle burr or burdock, but this one is the absolute worst. That burr is hard and the spikes are so sharp they can actually puncture tires. Wow, that's a bad weed. You don't want to have that around and where we normally see it is in fence lines and around farmyards. So if you want to get it under control, if you can use Roundup, that is by far the best option. Otherwise, we like high rates of dicamba or 2,4-D where labeled. Yeah, so a lot of times we'll get calls on this because people will say, well, I sprayed the dicamba or the 2,4-D, especially 2,4-D, I don't like you spraying dicamba in a backpack, by the way, but 2,4-D, and I go, well, what kind of 2,4-D did you get and what rate did you use? The problem is typically this, too much water, not enough 2,4-D. So up your rate of 2,4-D, use the highest labeled rate, and you should get control. Well, if you see puncture vine around your farm, don't waste any time, get it under control today. That's all for this week's Weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. Introducing the all-new Diamant Cornhead from Capello USA. 
With a revolutionary design, highly innovative for its class, we have painstakingly designed every component down to the smallest detail to maximize your harvest efficiency. This gives you unprecedented standards in operation and performance. For more information about this beast, available only in our new Gray Poly, call 855-CAPELLO or visit capellausa.com to find a dealer near you. Capello, wherever you are, we are. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. How much money are you leaving in the bin? If you want the most profit from your stored grain, you need the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. This low cost bin monitoring solution tracks temperature and humidity and gets your grain in ideal condition. And with deep preseason discounts on all Grain Temp Guard units, now is the best time to upgrade. Don't leave your money out in the bin, get the most from your grain. Order today at farmshopmfg.com. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. When you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line, then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. want to boost your high yielding soybeans to new levels, it may be nitrogen that you're running short on. How to apply nitrogen in soybeans late in the season is the subject of today's Iron Talk. First of all, why would you apply nitrogen to soybeans? Here are a few givens. Nodules in ideal soil and weather conditions can only produce about 70% of your soybeans nitrogen needs. Organic matter can release roughly 20 pounds of nitrogen per 1% of organic matter, and fertilizer sources like MAP or DAP just don't contain much nitrogen. So let's take this example. If you're shooting for 70 bushel soybeans, they require the uptake of about 305 pounds of nitrogen. Nodules can produce up to about 210, that would be 70%. Now if soil had 2% organic matter, that would give you another 40 pounds of nitrogen. And if you applied 100 pounds of MAP to meet most of your phosphorus demand, you'd get about 10 more pounds of nitrogen there. So you add all that up and you're still short 45 pounds for what the crop is going to need. The ideal time to apply nitrogen is so that availability will come in the R3 stage, which is first pod, and later in the season. Prior to R3, only about 10% of a soybean plant's nitrogen uptake has occurred. The challenge as the season goes on though, is that the crop is big. The solution is either a high clearance sprayer or a high clearance spreader. On our farm, we've used some controlled release urea in strip trials through a spreader. Where nitrogen was the yield limiting factor in the field, we were able to push yields and get a good return. We've also looked at some liquid nitrogen with a nitrogen stabilizer with a high clearance sprayer applied alongside the rows. Once nitrogen is spread on the surface, you need some rain or irrigation water to get it into the soil and up through the root system to feed that high protein soybean seed. There's some promising yield data out there, especially if you have high yielding soybeans and low organic matter soils. We'll see this year if it pays once again. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. Well, that's our time for today, but before we go, we want to encourage you to check out the Ag PhD radio show. We're on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central each weekday. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Thank you.